COVID confessions. The PM admits mistakes were made during the pandemic. Speaking at the G7 summit, Boris Johnson acknowledged failings in his government's response to COVID-19. We need to make sure that we don't repeat some of the errors that we doubtless made in the course of the last 18 months or so. Down with the kids, the First Lady and the Duchess meet local school children as Kate comments on her new niece. Oh, I wish her all the very best. I can't wait to meet her because we haven't yet, um, yet met her yet, so hopefully that will be soon. I am live in Cornwall where senior royals and some of the most powerful politicians on the planet have gathered. Also tonight... COVID cases surge, driven by the Delta variant. Public health experts urge the government to delay easing England's restrictions. And... <laughs> Countdown to kick off. The wait for Euro 2020 is almost over. Cornwall, this is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening from St Ives in Cornwall, where some of the world's most powerful leaders are meeting for this weekend's G7 summit. Top of the agenda, day one, the coronavirus pandemic, and our Prime Minister admitted the mistakes had been made here. In his opening address, Boris Johnson said it was vital that there was no repeat of the errors of the past 18 months. Now, that all came amid further evidence of the rapid rise of the Delta variant in the UK. 30,000 cases have been reported in the past week. And we'll get more on that in a moment. But first, here's our political correspondent, Libby Vina, on the Prime Minister's call to learn the lessons of the pandemic. The strangest of beach parties was getting underway in Cornwall this afternoon. The President of the United States and First Lady among guests invited for elbow bumps with the Prime Minister and Mrs Johnson. Joe Biden, ever the seasoned diplomat, was happy to play along. Everybody in the water. But at this first post-Brexit G7, relations among the Allies are under strain. The issue of Northern Ireland's status could easily knock things off course. The central focus for these leaders remains the pandemic and how the world can be better prepared in future. The Prime Minister today unusually frank about how it had been handled. So we've all been going through the most wretched uh, pandemic uh, our countries have faced for our lifetimes. We need to make sure that we learn the lessons from the pandemic. We make, need to make sure that we don't repeat some of the errors that we doubtless made. With women's education also on the agenda, his hopes for the recovery included this unexpected promise. Building back greener and building back fairer and building back more equal and, uh, how shall I, more, in, in, in a more gender neutral and perhaps like a more feminine way. Earlier, France's President Macron had made a point of hosting a separate gathering of European leaders, having warned ahead of the summit that the EU wouldn't tolerate any British attempts to renegotiate the Brexit deal. Mr Michel, are hello. you hopeful you can reach agreement with hello. Boris Johnson? Hello, hello. Do you trust the Prime Minister? The EU Council president wouldn't say, but it seems Joe Biden was keen to find a way forward when he met the Prime Minister. What really shone through uh, is the President's determination to help uphold the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, it was achieved on the back of enormous amounts of American support. We've always had good American support from successive Presidents. Uh, and as the Prime Minister said, on upholding the Good Friday Agreement, we're all on the same page. But there are many here vying for the new President's attention. The United States potentially once again playing a key role in resolving squabbles among its European allies. Libby Vina, ITV News, St Ives. 
And our political editor, Robert Peston, is here. Robert, what do you make of the Prime Minister's admissions that mistakes have been made? So that was very striking, wasn't it? And there are sort of two elements to it. Um, because I've been talking to the Foreign Secretary and I asked him to explain. And what he said was, first of all, there were plain mistakes that the international community made. You know, in general, you know, particularly the rich Western countries didn't recognise the gravity of the crisis until, frankly, you know, we were suffering from too many infections. So the Prime Minister wants to talk about a new early warning system. Um, I think a more rational approach to closing borders earlier to protect individual countries. But then there's the separate element, which is what many people at home want to know, is what has the Prime Minister learned about his own mistakes? Again, I talked to Dominic Raab. Many people would say one of the really uh, worst things they did was not to start mass testing really till sort of April, May. Uh, and, I, you know, Raab conceded that, among other things, these were lessons they had to learn. And actually, I was quite struck by the language he used. He, you know, basically said, yeah, we made mistakes. Well, as you say, you spoke to the Foreign Secretary, yeah. Dominic Raab, mm. and you also asked him about the uh, Brexit row that's yeah. brewing at the moment. What did he say about that? So he made no attempt to deny that America has been pretty cross with the UK for, in its view, playing fast and loose with this Northern Ireland protocol, which supposedly underby, underpins, excuse me, the Good Friday Agreement, which again underpins peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, like the EU, they think we shouldn't be trying to sort of tear it up so soon after we signed it, only a few months ago. But it's equally clear that yesterday the Prime Minister had very constructive conversations with the Prime Minister. Um, it's just possible, Rob said to me, that we could get a compromise solution of some sort this weekend. There will be lots of pressure from European leaders. Fingers crossed for all of us, and particularly for those in Northern Ireland who want sausages from Great Britain, <laughs> that some deal is sorted. OK, fingers crossed indeed, Robert. Thank you. Well, the Queen and senior members of the royal family are also playing a really big part in the G7 summit. Tonight, they're attending a reception at the Eden, Eden Project. And earlier, the Duchess of Cambridge joined the First Lady, Dr Jill Biden, on a visit to a local school. Now, they were there to promote the importance of early, early years education, which is an issue really close to both their hearts. Here's our royal editor, Chris Shipp. It is a sight this Cornish village has never seen before. Sweeping into the school playground from a narrow lane, the convoy of cars for the First Lady of the United States. So many vehicles, in fact, even nose to tail. They only just fitted in. It was the first engagement at the G7 summit for the royal family. This one was the Duchess of Cambridge's, who shares with Jill Biden a passion for education, especially the early years. Hello. Although a royal and a White House visitor at the same time appeared to stun the class of four and five year olds into silence. This is my classroom, yeah. It's the quietest class I've ever been in. I know, I agree. <laughs> The focus of Kate's work for some time has been on the first five years of a child's life, more pivotal for development than any other moment. And as a former teacher herself, Dr Biden knows the significance of what the Duchess is trying to do. So I can tell you that as a teacher at the, at the upper levels, if they don't have the, a good foundation, they fall so far behind. Ultimately, my hope is that we change the way we think about early childhood, and I hope our two countries can keep sharing data, knowledge and, and best practice. With that kind of transatlantic cooperation on this issue and some rabbits in the school field, this was a very harmonious afternoon. But there was a question from an American reporter about that American baby, Harry and Meghan's, born last week. Do you have any wishes for your new niece, Lilibet? Oh, I wish her all the very best. I can't wait to meet her because we haven't yet, um, yet met her yet. So hopefully that will be soon. <laughs> and with that matter dealt with, both Duchess and First Lady left for an appointment with the Queen. Thank you so much.
And this is as close as we can get to the Eden Project in Cornwall tonight. As you can well imagine, there's a ring of steel around that attraction behind me because not only are there the world leaders there, but they've tonight been joined uh, by the royal family. The Queen, in fact, arrived in just the last uh, few minutes to meet the Prime Minister and his wife, and she was then followed uh, by Prince Charles and Camilla, as well as Prince William and Kate. This is the government not passing up on the opportunity to deploy the royal family, use them to the maximum effect. It is, after all, something that Britain can do that very few other countries can. And tonight, Prince Charles will try and connect CEOs from the big companies to the world leaders on climate change. And he will say, we are doing a global fight for the pandemic. It's now time for us to do it. He will say, for the planet. OK, Chris Ship at the Eden Project, thank you. Well, as the G7 leaders discussed how to deal with the effects of the pandemic, there were further signs of just how quickly the Delta variant is spreading right across the UK. Now, there have been more than 8,000 cases in the past 24 hours alone. That's the highest daily number since February. And the reproduction, or R number as it's called in England, is between 1.2 and 1.4, meaning that the epidemic is indeed growing. And that's raised more doubts about further on locking for England, set for preliminary case certainly June the 21st. But it's hoped the UK's vaccination programme could keep us one step ahead. Here's our health editor, Emily Morgan. By all accounts, this is what is going to help lead us to freedom. Okay. But with the Delta variant first detected in India rapidly spreading, it's likely to be further off than we all hoped. In areas where cases are high, public health directors want certainty the government will delay. I think it's really important that we don't lose the ground that we've gained from the previous lockdown. And therefore, I think if we were to delay easing of restrictions, if the data shows that, which we'll clearly hear about more on Monday, but if the experience from Kingston and London shows, you can get rapidly increasing rates. Public Health England now thinks it's 60% more infectious than the so-called Kent strain. On June the 3rd, the number of cases of the Delta variant in the UK stood at around 12,000. That has since increased by nearly 30,000 to more than 42,000 today. PHE estimates infections are doubling every four and a half to 11 and a half days, which means a week from now there could be more than 85,000 cases. Nearly two-thirds of the cases were in people who hadn't been vaccinated, giving more hope the jabs are doing their job. But despite that, the biggest hint yet tonight, a delay is on the cards. Um, is the delay to unlocking going to be two weeks or four weeks? You'll have to wait for Monday for that one. No denial the 21st of June could be pushed back makes the owner of this comedy club even more anxious. Operating at just half capacity, he and other venues are desperate to reopen fully. Science says one thing, we think another. Unfortunately, that doesn't help us for planning staff, stock, customers. You know, we, people aren't booking in advance now, so we need to get some sort of answer as soon as possible. But the scientists are in agreement. Buying a bit more time could be the difference between a very large wave or a small one. Any delay obviously gives time to vaccinate a large proportion of the population, um, so that's good. Um, so I think what's been discussed is maybe two, maybe four weeks. One uh, difficulty is not to delay too much. There is no doubt infections are now on the march. The question is, have we vaccinated enough people to avoid what some are saying is now the inevitable? Emily Morgan, ITV News. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, with a little over an hour to go, fans gathering for the start of the Euros. Plus... I gaze at the sillies in the blue far away a sea shanty from Cornwall to world leaders. Those stories and more after the break, so do stay with me.
Hello again, welcome back. Now the long-awaited Euro Football Championships kick off tonight in Rome with Italy hosting Turkey. And while the stadium isn't going to be packed, of course, some supporters will be allowed in. Something unthinkable even a year ago. Now there are fan zones too, meaning it will feel like football is back again and fans of the three home nations involved simply can't wait. As our sports editor Steve Scott reports. <laughs> Not that long ago, it was feared the Euros would have to happen without fans. No, 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 no. Covid has ensured grounds won't be full to bursting, but like in Rome tonight, at least no stadia will be silent. The last of up to 1,000 Welsh fans left Cardiff today bound for Baku. Wales, the first of the home nations to play, their last Euros campaign involved a run to the semi-finals. It was incredibly special what we did last time. It was probably by far and above anything that we ever expected to do. So to do it again would be, would be very tough, very tough. But we have to believe. Euro 2020 is a tournament like no other, being played in 11 different cities across Europe. The first game kicks off shortly in Rome. Then it's to Azerbaijan tomorrow, where Wales take on Switzerland. England are the second of the home nations in action against Croatia at Wembley. And then on Monday, Scotland kick off their championships at Hampden Park versus the Czech Republic. On Sunday, Gareth Southgate will stand here and address his squad for the last time before their opener against Croatia. Every other manager will be hoping they finish their tournament doing exactly the same, because on the evening of Sunday, July the 11th, this will be one of the dressing rooms for the Wembley final. As ever, England won't go short of support for what is effectively a home tournament for them. I would say it's one of the most patriotic states you'll ever see in your life, to be fair. Not just in England, across Europe, all over the place. You've got Foden, you've got Rashford, you, they're, they're, they're young, they're, they're ambitious, they want it, they're hungry. And that's what gives me the spirit as well. And Scottish fans are sure to make the most of what is a first major tournament for them in 23 years. Scotland weren't in it, then I wouldn't be really interested. So I'm happy that Scotland are in the Euros. I'm looking for the, forward to the atmosphere and it's going to be like a lifetime, like things to remember, you know. It's been a long time coming and still faces Covid challenges, but after the past 12 months, the tournament is set to provide a welcome distraction for many millions right around Europe. Steve Scott, ITV News, Wembley. Well, as we've just heard, the first of the home nations in action is Wales playing Switzerland in Azerbaijan tomorrow. And Lucy Watson is in Baku tonight. So, Lucy, expectations really building, I guess. Well, this is the centre of Baku and the atmosphere is pretty great here this evening. The Welsh supporters have started to arrive and gather in the bars and the restaurants. Now, they might be depleted in number, but I've definitely heard a fair bit of singing already this evening. Now, we saw the team in action this afternoon inside the Olympic Stadium. It was their last training session before they perform against Switzerland tomorrow and they're expecting around 30,000 fans in the stadium tomorrow well that's how many they're allowed under covid restrictions now tomorrow's game is a pivotal one manager rob page has to get his tactics right now in his press conference this afternoon gareth bale said they will be concentrating on themselves and not their opponents they will be playing their own game now the swiss are in fact the favorites tomorrow but if the welsh fly out of the traps like they did in 2016. There's no reason why that momentum and that confidence they gain from that can't carry them through. All right, Lucy Watson in Baku. Thank you. Now, Scotland players will take the knee in solidarity with England before their European Championship game next week. The Scottish Football Association had originally planned to stand to show their opposition to racism before their games, but the reaction to their decision had prompted a change of heart. And we end tonight with an uplifting note or two from here in gorgeous Cornwall. During the lockdown, there was a surprise boom in the popularity of sea shanties. And the leaders of the G7 are going to be given a taste during a barbecue on the beach tonight. A little-known group called Do Hag Hour have been chosen to give the serenade tomorrow night, it is actually. And as Paul Davis reports, they can't wait for their big moment.
For this is my Eden, and I'm not alone. For this is my Cornwall, and this is my home. They are proud sons of Cornwall, and in traditional style tomorrow night, they'll be selling the joys of their county to their exclusive audience. All I can say is we're, we're honoured and privileged to be asked to do this. And it is a bit frightening for us, but we'll get through it. I stood on Cape Cornwall. Presidents, prime ministers and a chancellor will hear shanties originally sung by Cornish seamen. The group normally perform in pubs, but the biggest gig of their lives has not curbed their sense of humour. We did start our world tour two years ago, before the lockdown. Now, unfortunately, on a bus pass, you can't get very far. And we did about 40 miles, so we're thrilled that the world leaders have come to see us. <laughs> the only downside, Ronnie the dog, who attends every performance, must be left behind. He's not missed a gig so far, but... Um... For safety, well, security reasons, I think more so, he's, uh, he's not allowed to come tomorrow. Oh, this is my Cornwall. So Ronnie must miss out, but this is what the world leaders will be hearing as they wind down from any difficult discussions at their beachside barbecue. And this is my home. Paul Davis, Ooh. ITV News. Ooh. There you go, rousing end of the programme. That's it. Charlene's here with news at 10 at 10.20 tonight from me and all the team. And glorious Cornwall, goodbye. <laughs>